Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the um, symposium. Um, we're, uh, I'm delighted to be uh, kicking off the second day by introducing uh, John Hopfield, who is, as you probably all know, one of the world's leading uh, physicists, biologists, and computational neuroscientists. And he's made incredible contributions to all of these fields. Um, he's spent his career uh, at various places, including Princeton, where he is now, and Caltech, where he was David Mackay's supervisor. So um, we're delighted to have John here. I've got a bit of laryngitis, so a sound check would be very helpful for somebody in the back row to hold up their hand and say, I can hear you, or I can't hear you at all. Just, okay, maybe up. okay, okay, in the back. No, no they need a little higher. A little higher. Now let's give that a try. Thumbs up, okay, good. easier than talking in the hall last night. <laughs> I begin with two stories related to my interactions with David Mackay 30 years ago. David came to Caltech to be a graduate student in the newly created degree program, Computation and Neural Systems. Caltech education was administered through a structure with a five separate divisions. Each significant DPhil program was within a single division. There was an occasional degree program bridging two divisions, but they were weak and regarded as unfortunate failures. It took four years of institute politics for a degree option CNS to be created with educational requirements in three divisions, one of which contained physics, one contained biology, and the third contained engineering and applied science. The story of the academic politics, politics involved is worthy of a novel by C.P. Snow, but it's too long and sordid to be, to be counted to hear. Suffice it to say that many of the Caltech faculty were not inclined to help, expected the CNS students to be weak and the program to collapse. Only a few students with a brave confidence that this program made intellectual sense, like David, dared to sign up. After three years, the CNS program had almost universal support of the Caltech faculty. The professors had found that the CNS students were simply more interesting and more creative than typical graduate students admitted by conventional programs. David contributed extraordinarily to that change of faculty view because of his intellectual strength, because of, the, because of his ability to share that strength by educating others, students and faculty alike, and the enthusiasm with which he did so. I doubt that David has thought much about the critical role he played in early CNS, but I certainly have. The first conversation with David that I can remember took place in the shade of a eucalyptus tree near the Caltech track, where, where we each had gone running for relaxation. The general subject was the nature of the relationship of physical science to understanding human brain function. As a physical scientist, David accepted the idea that all biology is a consequence of the known laws of microscopic physics producing the future state of biological matter from the present state. We talked about whether there might nonetheless be new physics necessary to understand how the phenomena of mind and human behavior are produced by a brain. We were struggling with the question of what was meant by new physics in that perspective. David was trying to formulate a thesis research topic at the time, 
and ultimately chose a path far from our philosophical discussion. <coughs> Missed opportunity. Niels Bohr once addressed a similar question in 1932 in his famous lecture, Light and Life, when he was trying to grasp how the diverse, seemingly purposeful, complex phenomena described by the word life could emerge from lifeless physics. Bohr's lecture so impressed young theoretical physics physicist Max Delbruck that he left physics and turned to biology, ultimately garnering a Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine. Delbruck was disappointed that he never found the new physics hoped for by Niels Bohr. Eighty years later, there is a somewhat more understanding in physics of how phenomena or behaviors that are often called emergent can arise. Along these lines, the 1972 physics Nobelist, in 1972, the physics Nobelist P.W. Anderson wrote a paper entitled, More is Different. And I still recommend reading it to you all. The rest of this talk represents a small step toward emergence for the relationship between brain and computation, revisiting my 1988, 1988 conversation with David. Let's start with an example we completely understand. The phenomenon of airplane design. We're going to discuss the design of wings of an airplane in terms of in quantitative terms, using concepts like lift, drag, supersonic, stall, vortex, and so on. The physics fundamentals of aerodynamics is Newton's laws. F equals ma for about 10 to the 28th atoms and molecules interacting with simple forces. This description does not easily relate to the vocabulary useful for discussing airplane design. Instead, we use the Navier-Stokes equations in which air is a compressible fluid, wing surfaces are boundary conditions, and the very notion of atom or molecule has entirely disappeared. These equations relate much more to the desired vocabulary for airplane design. The Navier-Stokes equations are an emergent description of aerodynamics. We understand this emergence because we can derive the useful emergent equations from the microscopic underpinnings. Turn to human psychology and behavior. Words like choice, goal, mood, fear, learn, percept, think. This is the vocabulary we want to use to discuss psychology. At the bottom, we have neurons, synaptic currents, action potentials, physical stimuli. We want an emergent mathematics, like the Navier-Stokes equations, with which to make predictions and on which to found securely our verbal descriptions of human thought and human behavior. There will undoubtedly be multiple levels of emergence in the route between the fundamentals of neurobiology and, and consciousness at the top, for example. And I hope in this talk to talk just about taking one step in that hierarchy from the bottom nuts and bolts of neurons up one step in emergent phenomena. To illustrate the way that an emergent phenomenon of a set of neurons can perform useful computations, I will talk to begin with about one particular computation present in many guises. We rapidly recognize a spoken word by hearing it or by watching the face and lip reading. I visually recognize a particular friend at 50 yards, not by the details of the face or body, but by the way he walks. I will call such stimuli dynamic patterns to distinguish them from static patterns, such as photographs. Our behavioral world is filled with dynamic patterns which we need to recognize. Most natural dynamic patterns are not clocked at some fixed pace but have substantial variation of both duration and internal cadence. This variability of cadence means that matching the sensory stimulus to a stored template is not a good recognition algorithm. As, engin as engineers, we immediately turn 
to hidden Markov models to try to solve such problems. But no one has ever suggested, as far as I know, that neurobiology implements a hidden Markov model. So how can an ensemble of neurons solve this problem rapidly and effortlessly? I will sketch a way that a collective motion of an emergent coordinate solves the cadence problem. I will use one particular example, recognizing a spoken word in speech. The best physical analog I can give to this to the system I'm going to describe is, oh, just before I go any further, in neurobiology, there's a divide somewhere along the line. Small nervous systems work because of the way their individual components work and because of the way the particular pattern in which they are organized. A nematode with 302 neurons is like a very precisely built microprocessor. At the other end of the scale, you go to humans with 10 to the 11th neurons and 10 to the 14th <coughs> synapses. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between neurons and you and neurons and me. And so the principles of operation must be rather different from the principles of operation of the nematode. I'm going to stay in this, lar in this large size limit. And the general thrust of the talk is the idea that the, large, the laws of behavior are macroscopic that large physical systems tend to have robust emergent properties, like the Navier-Stokes equations, for example. And the sole exception to, I know to the idea that you have robust emergent properties is actually in digital computers, where engineering has deliberately suppressed all collective properties. Computers are dynamical systems, whether biological or engineered, whether analog or digital. What happens in the future depends on what happens in the present. There's an equation of motion describing how the, how the pattern of the machine develops in time. And I'm going to use and try to create an example in which the robust dynamics of a large neural system can be used by biology to produce good computational behavior. Now, in engineering, there's been an, an an interesting thing pursued 40 years ago, roughly, which has certain relationships between what I'm going to tell you. I just wanted to show you one engineering slide. The colored patch there shows a, pho a photograph of a thin sl sliver of a, a, a garnet, which is, uh, has a magnetic material. And under the right circumstances, it's chiefly magnetized one way, and it can be, have little droplets of reverse field magnetization. And you can see little things which have been called magnetic bubbles, because the very clever optics can distinguish between magnetization this way and magnetization that way in the crystal. These magnetic bubbles are stable entities. And in fact, magnetic bubble memory was used f f uh, 35 years ago as one of the alternatives for non-volatile non storage. And the interesting thing about the magnetic bubbles is that they are stable. Once you create one, it's stable. You can move it around. And in fact, if you want to take information from here to there, you don't, you don't uh, destroy a bubble here and create a bubble there. You actually move a bubble along by a magnetic field gradient. You fit. And on the, on the other hand, bubbles move. Atoms don't. The atoms are fixed. It's only the magnetization which is, it has this bubble behavior. You can make very similar things on a, a one-dimensional or more higher dimensional set of neurons. You take a set of neurons arranged in one dimension with short-range interactions, which are excitatory, where one tends to turn the other on, with long-range interactions, which are inhibitory. They, this on turns that one off. And you get a system which is, which is quite analogous to the magnetic bubble system, in which you can have, have on this stable, on this line of neurons, it could be quiescent, everybody could be turned off. But there's a stable entity, which a bubble, 
of excitations can be put somewhere on the line of neurons. And it can be put anywhere along the line of neurons. And in fact, it can be put somewhere along the line of neurons and moved along if, if, if you choose to. And this is not entirely imaginary neurobiology. I'm going to talk in terms of an engine, very engineering description. On the other hand, there are candidates in neurobiology for the kind of system I'm talking about today, the rat head, head direction cell network, in which the activity of cells is determined by the, the direction in which the head is facing, or the hippocampal place cell system within a particular environment and, and task there seems there could well be the two-dimensional bubbles of activity, very like the bubbles of activity in bubble memory. So to move forward, we're going to make, we're going to just begin with making a one-dimensional bump attractor by using these short-range excitatory and long-range inhibitory connections. These bumps are stable, and yet they can be moved by weak forces. There are various sources of force. The inputs of the neurons, asymmetry in the connections, firing rate or synaptic ad adaptation. But the important point is to think of the bubble as a stable entity and, have, and to describe what's going on in terms of moving the bubble rather than in terms of just uh, looking at too much individual detail of what neurons are active. The position of the bubble really describes what neurons are active. And to do dynamic pattern recognition, I will just take a a line of neurons hooked together in such a way that they will have a stable bubble along them and have, in, and have input lines which makes synapses on each of these neurons. The inputs are weak. As a result, the, in the inputs can move the bubble along, but they can't create the bubble. I'll use a very simple model of a neuron. A neuron is going to be taken as a, uh, as being an analog system having a firing rate as a function of input current, which looks like this and saturates. The synaptic properties are simple. When a, a virtual action potential comes along, there's a synaptic current, which lasts a little while and dies out. And that's, that's it for the neuron properties. Very simple dynamics of the neurons. Any interesting things which the circuit can do, it does because of the circuit structure not because of the properties of the neurons. As I remarked earlier, I'm going to, to um, do, deal with with, with with sound patterns. Three. 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 Just to give you an idea of the cadence difference between th th three people talking. And then the, ca the cadence difference is what I'm designing a system to deal with. And the, the top part of this slide shows a typical sonogram of somebody saying three. Or plotted in false color is the intensity of the sound. There are 20 different frequency bands spread from about um, 200 hertz to about 5,000 hertz. The power in each frequency band is spread out in time horizontally. Typical sonograms of, of spoken words. And I'll simply use information about the, the um, is the speech power spectrum coming in on these input lines which make connections to these various neurons. And if you design a system with any reasonable amount of intelligence, you can design a system to recognize a spoken three. What is plotted here 
this is a, these are the numbers of neurons. Neuron number one is the left hand end of a line. Neuron number 90 is the right hand end of a line. And so plotted horizontally is the activity of a neuron as a function of time. This neuron is off for a while, then it's on, then it's off again as a function of time. To begin with, before the speech, before anything is said, neurons um, 0 through 15 are on. The bump is at the left hand end of the line. The other neurons are all off. The other neurons are all off. At the end of the time, the bump has been moved to the right hand end of the line. Neurons 70 to 90 have been turned on, and all other neurons are turned on, uh, turned off. And I will view recognition as simply taking place when, oh, I just lost the cursor. There it is. Take, taking place when these neurons at the right hand end of the line become active. So the sound coming in, in this case, moved the bump from the left-hand end of the line to the right-hand end of the line. So it moved the bump from a place where you'd say nothing had been said to a place where you'd say three has just been spoken. How does it do this? It does it by actually having cleverly contrived inputs as a function of time to the various neurons. So neurons down, down in, in this region, have, have, are driven by a th the beginning of three. Neurons up here are down in this region are driven by E at the end of three. In between, you've got neurons that are driven by an R-like sound. And if you contrive it right, the input to the various, this is now false color of the input to various neurons as a function of time. And you can see that there is an input peak which moves from the left-hand end of the line to the right-hand end of the line. That's what moves the, the clump along. And with three is spoken by another speaker at another cadence, you can see that the pattern of inputs is somewhat different, but there's still this trough, there's another peak going from one end to the other, which drags the bump from one end to the other, and that says that this will be recognized as a three, even though the cadence is entirely different. And uh, zero. That's zero. We know that the neurons for a three detector are driven strongly up toward the right hand end of the line by an E, and you can see that happening here. In the, in the false color input as a function of time. The, uh, that says E is very strong early in zero. Why doesn't, the, why doesn't the bump move to the end of the line which is driven by E? And the answer is very simple. There's no, there's no pathway to get there. And so the fact that the, these neurons are strongly activated, they're strongly activated but they never turn on because the only way to turn them on is to move the bump and the bump is nowhere near, nearby. And that's why zero is not recognized, by, and three is. The signal inputs to the system are weak inputs. If we, look, if we look at any particular neuron as a function of time, it has inputs which come from the circuitry within the area which is maintaining the bump, and inputs which are coming from the signal. The inputs which are coming from the sensory signal are small compared to the inputs which are coming from the, circ from the, from the recirculating circuitry of reverberant connections. So the, the signal inputs are weak. The dominating inputs to the system are the, are the feedback connections, not the signal input. And one is reminded in this regard of things like the primary visual cortex, where if you look at the layers where input comes from the sensory system, most of the synapses are actually not from the sensory system. Most of the synapses in the area in which the sensory system arrives, sensory signals arrive, most of the inputs are actually from other parts in feedback connections. So the sensory signals and visual cortex are actually a weak part of the signal as they are here in this model. <coughs> 
Uh, this merely shows more recognitions. This one I will do just, just, just for fun, if I can find it. Yeah. That succeeded in recognizing the one part rather than the zero part, in spite of the fact that these two speech signals coming in absolutely together, spoken actually in the same speaker's voice. This is the kind of thing which just raises havoc with conventional ways of processing speech. And yet you can see there's this nice avenue leading up, dragging the bump from one end to the other and this would be properly recognized. I should have promised not to do any maths. I won't do any maths. But the important thing to realize, there is a collect one single equation which describes the collective behavior of the bump motion in response to the signal. And so there are two ways you can figure out what's happening to the bump. You can either solve exactly the equations of motion for the activities of 100 neurons, or you could use the single equation, which represents the collective mode, represents a mathematical description of an emergent coordinate. And these two, these two different ways of calculating the bump motion agree very well. In short, the collective motion captures most of the essence of how the system operates. In the last couple of minutes, I'm going to turn to a slightly more complicated system, which has conceptually two bumps, two dimensions, and is related to hippocampal systems. But I won't really go back all the way to the fundamentals of the neurons in this. I'll use the fact that there is an immersion description which we can understand. I remind you, most of you know already, that there are place cells in the hippocampus of rats, place cells which are active. A particular place cell is active when a rat is in one location and inactive when the rat is very far away from that location. If I look at what cells are active in the rat hippocampus at the moment, if the, that black line is taken to be the outline at the hippocampus, a particular subset of the cells is strongly active at the moment. A second later, it'll be a different subset. A second later, it'll be a different subset because the rat will have moved. These subsets don't make any particular sense unless you actually plot things not according to where the cell is located in the hippocampus, but plot activity where it would be in a spatial map if I plot the activity where the, at the center of the receptive field, the place field. In that case, you can see that there should be a clump of activity. And uh, and it plotted this way, the same thing which I showed you just a moment ago would be a clump of activity of the cells following the motion of a rat in space. Now suppose you have a two-dimensional system where you've stabilized a bump of activity. The bump of activity, to begin with, could be put anywhere on that two-dimensional system. By putting inputs to the system, by putting asymmetries in the connections, you can create, you can make a system where the bump of activity isn't stable anywhere, but where it actually is driven to move. And one of the patterns you can get is a pattern you can easily make, is a pattern in which the activity moves the, the clump toward a particular point in space. You could think of that as being a representation of the, of the idea that the rat could be somewhere and it would like to move to that central point in space. 
And this, uh, if you make a system of this sort, you make a system using ideas that are already present in the hippocampal lore, where the rat activates a clump of activity by opening his eyes, closes his eyes, and the clump of activity will then move to a goal. Now that's an imaginary process in the sense that the rat can imagine getting to the goal, but the rat, of course, wants physically to get to the goal. So how can you get this motion of a clump of activity in mental space to couple to physical activity? Well, there are easy examples uh, where this is this clearly happening in biology. And the simplest of these is I put up a single spot of light in a black field, and you look at it with both eyes. And to begin with, you will see two spots. And the reason you see two, two spots is that the eyes are not coordinated. And the, where the spot of light is from the right hand retina and from the red hand, left hand retina are not superposed in the cortex. And what you will do is to make a convergence motion so that the eyes, so those two bumps of activity become coordinated. And so there, one knows that in neurobiology, there must be simple circuitry, which allows you to take two bumps and have a muscle command, which tends to make the bumps overlap more. And that's what you, need, that's what you basically need to have goal-directed behavior. What you need to do is to have two bumps of activity one is a sensory bump, which is centered on where the input say that you actually are. The other is the mental bump with synaptic asymmetry, which makes a force moving that bump toward the goal. And then you need to add some connections between them. And the two things you have to have are inputs to this, from the sensory bump to the mental neurons, which constrain the sensory bump to be near the, your actual location. And then you need motor commands on the basis of what is the difference between where you would like to be and where you are. And with those two, you can put together a little bit of elementary physics, which says this is basically a physical position and a mental position. The mental position is being drawn toward a goal, but the mental position is also being drawn toward the physical position. And the physical position Is, is changed by two kinds of forces. One is the forces due to motor commands. The other is the forces caused by the friction, the terrain, and the realities of the physical, physical world. This gives you an overall system which is capable of having goal-directed behavior in the sense that if I now perturb the system by moving the system, by, by moving the rat over, for example, the physical position will move, the mental position will move, the mental position will still be drawn toward the goal, and you'll have a system which has achieved the goal in spite of all kinds of perturbations. It's a nice feedback system. But the idea is basically that you need two interacting bumps, one of which represents something which is drawn toward a goal but in mental space, and the other one of which describes where you are and have motor commands based on the difference between these two. Given my voice under the moment, the moment, you can probably read these more, better than I can actually describe them. But that's, that's a basic summary. And uh, I, I, I think one can easily show in model systems these things will produce robust computational and motor behaviors. What's open for grabs is whether this kind of thing, looking for emergent phenomena, is actually something which evolution has also done and therefore will have become important in human neurobiology. The other open issue is whether such, useful, such things could actually be useful in an engineering context, whether or not this is exactly what neurobiology does. David, you can see I haven't gotten very far, but I'm still engaged in the same topic. It's going to last forever. Thank you. <laughs>
We have time for some questions. I, I have a question, actually, John. Um, is the goal, uh, how is the goal represented? Is that represented in the pattern of connectivity, or is that represented by another um, bump of activity? The, the easiest way to, rep to represent where a goal is, if you have a slight asymmetry in the synaptic connections, then, then when you have a bump <laughs> somewhere, it will move spontaneously to that place determined by the, the, the non-symmetry of the connections. So the goal of activity is, the goal is present in the connections by previous learning. Yes. Yeah. Pass the mic. I liked your example of the C. elegans as having this small nervous system that packs in a lot of computational power into few neurons. And you make a case that as the nervous system scales up in size, the individual computational power, if you like, drops in the neurons. So what's gained by making this larger nervous system? Do we gain flexibility at the cost of the individual computational power of the neurons? Or is there actually some interesting mix of the two things? Is it really true that individual neurons in a mammal, for example, are just dumb entities? and not particularly sophisticated, whereas the C. elegans neuron is more sophisticated. The neuron, neurons in mammals are not dumb entities. They also have elaborate properties. In order to try to derive things having to do with collective behaviors, I have deliberately kept the model neurons much simpler than the neurons in real neurobiology. The thing you gain out of collective behaviors is robustness, spontaneous robustness. Um, if I change the laws of how molecules collide in the air a little bit, nothing happens to aerodynamics. And one of the, th one of the things which you definitely want to have in a neural system is robustness against damage, robustness against noise. And you don't have to design it in if you get it from emergent phenomenon. In your model, a uh, neuron that uh, recognized digits like three or so, uh, how did you train that network, that model network? Where, where did the information go in that it should for, recognize for, for, three? For, for speech or for, 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 for the goal-directed behavior? For the speech. For speech, I actually hand-wired an appropriate pattern for a given model template, knowing that the model template could then be distorted in any way you wanted in time, and it would still work. You ought to be able to learn it. I have not endeavored to write down a learning procedure for this kind of network. It needs to be done. Okay. Um, so at the start of your talk, you said that no one had ever tried to implement a hidden Markov model. Um, and I was reminded of Mars model of the cerebellum, where you have parallel fibers, which um, take the time dimension into motion on the cerebellum. And that's a different way of doing the same kind of motion that you're doing with your bubbles. And you could imagine learning via inhibitory synapses in the connections with the Purkinje cells, something maybe a little bit like a hidden Markov model, I just wonder. And the cerebellum, of course, action potentials and action potential timing, I think, becomes very important. I would love to be able to do anything whatsoever with respect to collective variables and emergence and action potentials. And I just have not been mathematically sharp enough or physically sharp enough to do so. I would love to understand the role of action potentials in all these things. Okay. Um. So let's thank John Hupfield again.